Okay, we should be live now on Facebook. Uh, so we're on Zoom. So hi, everybody. I'm Scott Skiba. Welcome to Page to Stage. Uh, each week, we've been going through the process of talking with somebody on the design and production team, the creative team, and exploring the process of bringing opera from the page to the stage. Um, we started with uh, technical direction and scenic design, went to pro projection design, uh, last week we talked about lighting design and this week uh, we're going to talk about costume design and we have um, with us here uh, Tesha Benson. Hi Tesha. Hello. How are you two? How are you doing today? You know pretty good. Good. Pretty good. And then it started snowing so I'm not sure about that. Oh it's snowing? But other than that I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's fun. Fun that it's snowing. Yeah. Right? Um, well thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking time. So I'm trying to manage the technology here. Sometimes I can uh, keep an eye on everything that's happening um, and, and try to try to see the comments and everything. So I'm gonna see if I can also see that. But Tesha, could you start out telling us what what is a costume designer? What do you do? Um, so as a costume designer, I am responsible uh, for the visual storytelling surrounding the clothing, um, hair and makeup that it, the actor wears. Um, during performance and making sure that that um, whole look is cohesive throughout all of the characters and fully supports um, the mood of the piece, um, the action of the piece, and uh, the storyline of the piece. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking to see how can I take all the different design elements of, you know, form, line, texture, color, um, and to combine them into evocative uh, stories using clothing. Awesome. Um, how, how did you get into costume design? How did you, how did you know, like, I want to design costumes? <laughs> um, I didn't know it. Uh, so when, my father's a lighting designer. <laughs> and so I grew up, kind of backstage with him going to, he does a lot of dance. So watching dance and believing that I should be a ballerina. And he told me that I shouldn't be a ballerina because ballerinas get really messed up feet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I spent a lot of time at the library because we were very sheltered children. And so I was always getting out like costume history books from the library as a kid and copying them mm -hmm. because I thought it was cool and I was into history and whatever. Um, so, I actually went to undergrad as an undecided major. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but my dad kept saying, oh, you could be a costume designer because I had a lot of thesis papers that would then revolve around fashion. Um, so I, as part of one of my, um, well, we had to go see fine arts events or whatever. And I went and saw hair. Mm -hmm. that the college had done. And then I was like, no, I have to do this. And then that was it. And I, <laughs> I went head on into that. I think I auditioned for like one or two shows because I had been like an in drama club in high school. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see that. There's too much eyebrows. It's not, it's not a thing. Um, <laughs> so I went and I started working in the costume shop. I had already known how to sew because my mom had shown me how to sew. Mm -hmm. Um, so I went and I worked in the costume shop and I got myself into being an assistant to the costume designer. And then I was actually able as a senior in undergrad to design a show for my capstone. So I did Into the Woods then. Oh, great show. First of five Into the Woods. Oh, um, and then I went on to graduate school because I felt like I needed to know more because I had only really been a theater major for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I went on to graduate school and then here we are. A million awesome. years later, nice. still drawing. I think for me, I, what I like about theater is that, or opera, whatever, any of the disciplines that are performing arts, because yeah. I've done theater, I've done dance, I've done opera. Um, what I like about it is that you get to work with other people and you get to collaborate. Um, if I just wanted to make up ideas on my own about what people should wear, I should be a fashion designer, right? Mm -hmm. If I just, just get to be the author of the whole story, I would be a fashion designer, but to me, I'd rather have those conversations and work with other people um, and try to bring something that I had first only had in my imagination, like you do when you read a book, into real life. And so yeah. that's kind of how I got there. Yeah. Um, 
you, you mentioned uh, you designed for theater, for dance, for opera. Is, is there anything about opera that you would say is is different? I mean, obviously they're all live performance art forms, at least they used to be. <laughs> Who knows what our sure. world will hold for us now? Um, but yeah. is there anything about designing for opera that is different or are they all pretty much the same? Um, well, I think good design is good design, no matter what it is. But I think each of the disciplines gives you different opportunities to explore something about how clothes relate to the body. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of all of the disciplines, opera gives you the most opportunity to make really big choices because opera is really big because it's nowhere in life are people singing their whole story. Nowhere in life is an orchestra following you around. And it's different than a musical because musicals try to break back into some version of reality. So you're always kind of coming back to something that feels real, mm -hmm. but opera has such a grand scale and tends to be presented on much larger stages that you have an opportunity to make um, maybe louder color choices or more decorated choices on your costume. Um, and just different kinds of details that you wouldn't necessarily see in something like a straight play, because mm -hmm. that's not how we present ourselves normally in life. Yeah. Um, I think there is some overlap between opera and dance and the fact that I, I think opera singers use their body in a very specific way and dancers use their body in a very specific way. So you have to consider those uh, boundaries as well. You have to make sure that the singer is able to get enough breath support when they're singing. So if you're fitting them into a more tightly fitted garment, making sure you're checking that they feel that they can expand as much as they need to um, yeah. and do any, any other athletic movements that they might need to do on stage, just like you would if you were doing a dance piece. Yeah, I, I mentioned that this afternoon on, on Wednesdays, we, we have a daily like Opera 101, you oh, know, cool. quick five minute, you know, tidbits of info, family friendly stuff on Facebook and I said, hey, I'm gonna be uh, interviewing Tesha Benson tonight and we're gonna be talking about costume design. And I talked just a little bit about, you know, how, how stepping into the clothing really helps an actor get into character and the shoes. And we talked a little bit about corseting or, or anything that's form fitting and how when a singing actor gets fitted because there's so much expansion and things when they breathe that it's a really important you know, take a breath now when I'm measuring you so that we don't tie you in. Do you have, have any fun anecdotal stories about um, I that? think I think corsets get a bad rap. I think the only time I've had issue with that is when someone has come into the fitting and they already have it in their head that it's going to be too tight and I'm not going to be able to breathe. <laughs> and so just and anybody who's watching, who's a performer and someone's coming at you with a corset, none of us are interested in tight lacing you. None of us are interested in making it so that we actually change your body shape. The most it's going to do if you're a woman is hold your bust. So just think of it as more like, it's just a much larger bra. <laughs> We're just trying to get the shape of the period. And we know that you're all modern people who've been wearing, you know, mostly elasticized garments for the past 20 years because that's what clothes are now right yeah. so whenever... i've been wearing mostly elasticized garments in this whole quarantine so exactly <laughs> well everything everything think about it. lots of jeans actually have lycra in them so even jeans aren't as stiff as they used to be um so we're never interested in making you not be able to breathe and i think a good a good costume designer or costume technician in that fitting will once we get the corset set, we'll ask you to do a few things that you've already done in staging or that you might imagine you might do in staging or singing and have you do those actions first before yeah. we get any further because we don't wanna put ourselves in the position where we fit you in something, you say, A plus, I feel great, but you don't really. Now we're making your garment and now it's not gonna fit because when you come back to that next fitting, you're gonna have an issue <laughs> and now we're gonna have to do more work. So we'd rather just have a really honest conversation at the front end. Yeah. Of the, and is that something that does that involve the the direct stage director other people in the conversation about you know what kind of movement does this person do do you do you talk about that when you're we'll get into yeah, you put together a really nice presentation and we'll look sure. at specific design um but is that the kind of stuff that you have in mind when you're you know you're conceiving of the sketches and thinking about what you can do to say well does this person have to do anything crazy are they rolling around jumping around or are they just standing yeah i think um I think that would come a little later in the process after we've made some choices, but if we already know that it's going to be a pretty athletic piece, I would have that conversation with the staging director pretty early on in the process. I, you don't want to get 
locked into making choices that won't then support the action that's actually going to happen on stage. So for me, I don't like to start with those practical ideas because I would rather first start with the things that are the emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. So like when I'm doing research, I'm always listening to the music of the piece that I'm working on. As I'm drawing, I'm still listening to the music um, yeah. to really feel like I'm in it. Um, so I'd rather start with those emotional things. And then once we've kind of fleshed out a little bit of that emotional reaction, then get down to the nitty gritty of, Hey, by the by, they're going to jump up and down on a bed or whatever that yeah. is, you know, so that we can say, okay, that's good to know. Let's get in conversation also with scenery and say, Hey, they're going to jump up and down on a bed, but this person's really needing to be in heels earlier. So can we make sure it's not too soft or whatever that right. is, right. and then make those accommodations from there. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, now, as a designer, what, what is your team like that you, you'd work with? Like there's costume shop, you know, like we, we talked a little bit about, you know, with, with lighting design, projection design, TD, scenic, you know, some other, other jobs that go around with that. But is it just you in the shop and like the magic mice, like Cinderella? Or is there a no. whole team of people with specific jobs that are doing things to make this all come together? Okay, so I, again, remembering that I came from a theater background and that my father is a Marine. Uh, so I'm always saying it's not theater magic, it's hard work, right? So there's a lot of people in the background who are making things happen. Um, uh, and sometimes costumes gets really irritated because we end up being the thing that has to fix something when we get into production because we appear to be the easiest thing to fix because it's closed. Um, <laughs> but so... <laughs> uh, that aside, you, if you are having a fully, a fully supported shop, um, the structure goes like this. So you have your shop manager and your shop manager is in charge of the entire costume shop and all of the artisans who work in the costume shop and helps delineate the workflow, but also helps you as like a designer who usually is a guest to the theater, um, do any kind of ordering, uh, getting you around in, coordinating getting you around town to do shopping for the show. Um, if you're in a house that's doing uh, <clears throat> rentals, a lot of times the shop manager will also act as a costume coordinator in those senses mm -hmm. to get the show going. So the shop manager is in charge of everyone. And then usually you have teams who work under the shop manager and each of those teams will be headed up by a draper. So if you had a lot of builds, you might have three drapers in the shop who each have their own teams uh, with a first hand underneath them. So the first hand helps them with cutting and pattern alteration. Um, and the draper is the person who takes all the fabric on the dress form and makes the pattern. Kind of, if you've ever watched Project Runway, you've seen that. Um, and then beneath that uh, draper in first hand usually is a team of two or three stitchers who then sew everything together. Um, you can also have underneath the, just the shop manager leads crafts person. So maybe someone who's really good at working with leather or doing hats or doing any painting and dyeing that needs to happen in the show. And sometimes that person has additional people underneath them, just depending on how large uh, the organization is. And if it's a really big organization and you're really lucky, you might have someone who's a tailor and then has stitchers under them as a tailor. Um, mm -hmm. Because men's wear is very different than women's wear. And so drapers don't usually tend to build new garments for men in the same way because mm -hmm. tailoring has a lot more insights to it. And so it's another very specific skill set. So okay. if you know you're going to be doing a lot of men's wear and you want to do builds of men's wear, you need to find someone who has got tailoring expertise. Sometimes drapers do, but a lot of drapers really focus more on women's wear. Um, is there, like when you're training, when you're studying, um, mm -hmm. Is there time spent on tailoring or is that usually like a separate course, separate discipline you'd study if you said, oh, I, I like I like being a draper, but I also would like to build the skills to be a tailor. Is it covered or is it an additional? Um, it depends. So the graduate program I went to also had a technical graduate degree. So they also they had costume design and costume technology as different mm -hmm. master's programs. Mm -hmm. um, and they had one class in tailoring and a lot of classes in draping. So if you wanna be a tailor, you would might take that one or two classes in graduate school and then okay. seek additional training from people who do it more regularly if you feel like. A lot of us are finding, you, you know, a lot of us are in a being self-taught on some level, right? You know, other disciplines like lighting, the technology is always changing. 
And so you're always having to keep up with that on your own. And even though the technology doesn't necessarily change a lot in costuming, I think a lot of us kind of get together and we're always sharing our knowledge. And it's really important as you go from shop to shop, mm -hmm. I'm always paying attention because, you know, I'm not always fortunate enough to have a whole team behind me. So I need to be paying attention and be like, oh, what's going on over there? Okay, right. you're doing this or that to make something happen. Right. Store that away for later, so. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And outside of that, sometimes shops give you assistance. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a costume design assistant who will maybe help with taking notes and fittings mm -hmm. and things like that. I think that's everybody. Yeah. I left so, someone out, I'm sorry. Costume. A lot of people. So if anybody people, is yes. watching now or tuning <laughs> in or they, they watch it later, um, yeah. they're going to the archive. How does one become a, a costume designer? You know, is it, I, know I have an interest in clothing or I have an interest in theater. I like creating and collaborating or all of those things. And I is think it something that to, can happen think, accidentally or? I think you need to like all of those things a little bit. You need to like art because you're making art, right? You need to like working with people because of all the design disciplines. You're the one who knows every actor by name and has a relationship with them. And we usually joke in costumes that you probably should have uh, a side degree in social work because everybody comes into that fitting room with how they feel about themselves. Mm -hmm. so, it, so there's a lot of interpersonal. You know, and there's a lot of interpersonal yeah, stuff. Yeah. I have lots of, you know, just horrifying stories of, you know, having to take actors and build them back together because maybe their director said something sideways about how they looked, or you're having to change something on a costume after you built them up to be like, you look amazing. I know you, you, you know, you don't normally show this much skin, but you look hot. And then they, uh, they get out on stage and the director turns to you and says, they, you need to cover them up. Now, what do you do when you turn, have to turn around and tell them that? So you have this really, you have to have a good idea of how to like work with other people and have conversations and be very diplomatic. Yeah. Um, and I think you have to like clothes. You have to like thinking about how people present themselves through clothing, Yeah. you know, and um, not be attached to your own personal style. Okay. Like, because you need to get like, your head. I think this is a good idea, but you know, based on the whole thing, yeah. it has some flexibility. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say that I, I know a lot of, you know, we, we work together at, at Baldwin Wallace uh, Conservatory, and that's uh, some of the productions we're going to show here. That's where they come from. Um, but when students graduate, I, I do know that one of the things that they, you know, just said just after we closed our last production that happened right before everything shut down was, Oh, I'm just, I'm going to miss Tesha so much. Like her costumes are so beautiful and they make me Aww. feel so good. No, no, it's a, it's a thing. I think there's a very personal you know, relationship that comes from that. Well, you know, you know it's, well, you know, I, when you get to work with people over and over again, you get to develop relationships with them. And like, you know, for instance, Jake has been in every, every opera that I've designed and we always get purple on him somehow, somewhere, because his first <laughs> costume was completely purple, you know? But yeah. it's like, this is our secret between we'll us. Think. You always have those little touches that are really just for you as the designer, because it pleases you. And for the actor, yeah. as it's like, here's this little thing inside your breast pocket. No one's gonna see it from stage, but it's gonna make a difference for you and your characterization that you know yeah. that it's there. Or this detail on the, on the, on the watch. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, we're not gonna see it from 30 feet away, but if I just gave you something plain, it would look very plain from far away. Right, but the that actor details, knows, more interesting. right? Like the actor knows and the other actors on stage know, so it it creates a feeling that even though the, the audience might be able to see the detail, they kind of feel the effect of that level of detail. Sure, sure. And the more detail you get, you have to, you learn over time what the level matters depending on how far away the space is. Uh, but the richness of detail doesn't really fully disappear. It's still there. It's just not necessarily the person in the back of the house sees everything. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to try to share the screen here, see sure. if, if we get success. Um, and I'll move forward um, as you would uh, like me to. I'm not sure. sure. Let me make sure it's sharing here because we have a lag on, on the live stream, but I, I think it will share. Um, hanging in there to see. Yay. Yes. Okay. Here we have success. So here we are and I can, I can walk us through here. Um, so this is something you put together for us. I'm going to advance. Yes. Uh, can you see it, Tesha? You're able to see the screen? I can see it. Yeah. Great. So, so I've got two shows here. The first one is El Matrimonio Segreto by mm -hmm. Sim Rosa, which is an opera buffa. Um, so this one, I have a lot. I had a lot. I chose this one because I think it's a strong show, but also I just happen to have a lot of digital 
sources for it because most of the design process had to happen over the internet because the director was in England. So we did a lot of things just over the internet and doing Zoom conferences like this. Um, so anytime that I start on a show, I usually have an initial conversation with the director of the show uh, to see the direction they want to take uh, this piece. Um, sometimes people call that a concept statement. Um, sometimes it's just called the director's vision. Um, but for this piece, I was working with a, a staging director named Noah Namat, and she had a conceptual idea about this play um, being set in a dollhouse as though the characters were all dolls. Um, and so after we had that initial conversation, and she actually brought some images to the table at that first meeting, which I always find really exciting. I'm really excited to have a conversation with the director where they brought some images to it, uh, to the table without it being overly specific, like I need this hat. Mm -hmm. If someone comes with me, I need this hat. I'm like, oh, you disengaged just a little bit. Um, but so she, we talked a lot about how she wanted bright colors, um, and she wanted this doll-like feeling. And so I came away and I, first thing you do is after you've listened to the music a whole bunch or read the script a whole bunch, then you're gonna go away and you're gonna do some research. So these are a few slides just on research plates. And what's interesting, if you look on Fidalmas, you'll see throughout these, actually on the uh, right-hand side of the plate, those are actually Barbie dolls that an artist had taken and <laughs> then redid like the makeup and everything on them and turn them in these high fashion looks. Oh, wow. um, and so we were trying to go for high fashion type feeling dolls. And so that was a really cool piece of research that we yeah. did. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, so it's Fidelma, Fidelma and Geronimo. I'll move to the next one here. Can go forward. Um, and then for Elisetta and Carolina, um, these are just a few, just one each. I had maybe like three or four research boards for each of them. Mm -hmm. um, but they're the sisters in the piece and she wanted them to feel very young, but very different. And so this is us starting to figure out what we thought was different about them. And we thought Carolina probably feels more approachable and she's clear, she's the good looking sister. And Elisetta is the bad looking, less desirable sister. Uh, so one of the things we found you can see in Elisetta's is this really huge bow idea mm -hmm. um, on top of this woman's head. Yeah, right there. Um, and that really sung to both of us. So that yeah. definitely showed up later in the piece. <laughs> Um, we'll go forward. There's just some more uh, images. And you can see I found a Ken doll. We really mm -hmm. wanted Paulino to be very youthful and attractive. Um, but ultimately, we weren't able to achieve that particular hairstyle um, because we decided we wanted everybody to have colored hair mm -hmm. and we had to make a balance there. Yeah, when I have, I've seen the, the show and the finished product, but this is the first time that I had had looked at the plates and it's all this I thought yeah okay totally I, I see that and in terms of like the collaborative part you know if, if we were looking at my initial you know research here for the Kant and and this is not how he ended up at all really mm -hmm. only thing that really remains in terms of like inspiration from here is maybe what's on the right hand side mm -hmm. uh, the director really was like oh the velvet's really interesting but I'm not really feeling that for him Mm -hmm. She wanted to create something that was a lot um, more modern feeling. And I think velvet doesn't give you a sense of modernness in the same way. Mm -hmm. Velvet feels very old world when you look at it because yeah. we don't wear it very often in everyday life. And so it feels like something far away people wear. So we decided yeah. not to go in that direction. Go ahead and move forward. For you. Um, so after I've done my research, I will do initial sketches. These ones happen to be in color. I don't always end up doing them in color, but I had bought some markers and I really was in love with them. So markers go really quick. Um, and this is usually how I approach initial sketches. I will sketch out what I think is my ultimate kind of idea going forward without feeling married to it. And then I'll usually, especially if I'm collaborating with someone who isn't in the room with me, I'll make notes on that sketch. Um, about how I feel about Oops. what's happening in this piece. I'm trying to zoom, not move forward, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, you're fine. So like, you know, you can see, okay, I think Fidalma, she's really all about these rules. She's trying to get these girls married off the best way she can. We really wanted to make her feel really tall and slim and controlled, but then really ostentatious because in her mind, she could get Paulino, right? 
Mm -hmm. So trying to keep these like slim lines and you'll see, I just have a lot of notes about each of the characters about why mm -hmm. I thought that was important. Another thing we had already decided from a very early point in our conversations is that we wanted each character to have their own color since there's only six characters um, and to use it as a way to subtly signal to the audience who ends up together at the end. So Fidelma and Hieronimo are brother and sister, so they don't end up with anybody but themselves at the end. So they're, we used uh, complementary colors across the color wheel. So mm -hmm. yellow and purple, and then you'll see the others coordinate as well. Now with, with these, Tesha, how, how far away are these sketches from a completed build? Uh, like, these are maybe like, two in, steps in terms away. of like time or the process? Um, I, we started working on this show in August. The, I probably finished these at, by the end of August. No, we started in June on this and I finished these in August. Um, and these weren't my final renderings. These were just the first ones. And then the show wasn't produced until March. Okay. Um, so we're working really far ahead of time, especially if you know you're gonna need to do builds in between the sketches and the final renderings, you're getting fabrics and things like that together mm -hmm. and getting those approved by the director as well. Yeah. Um, although out of all of these, she responded really well to most of them and liked most everything about them except for Elizetta. Mm -hmm. She did not like the silhouette that we I had chosen to put Elizetta in in this first iteration. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a long conversation about how it was good that we were trying to make them very different and appear very different and very dork. Make, I was trying to make her look dorkier by giving her this kind of A-line look. Mm -hmm. But it was important for the director that they kind of, that Elizetta kind of was trying to look like Carolina, you know, that, that there should be that feeling of competition where here there isn't, they're just really two different people. Yeah. So it's sillier and better if you go to the next one, the next slide, you'll see a sketch that then I did very quickly. Okay, well, you yeah. wanted to have the same silhouette. What if it was something like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, that it would be sillier and funnier if they were very similar, but couldn't be more different at the same time. Yeah. And then there's just some examples here on this uh, page here of other things that I sent along to the director. So this is me taking pictures of some of the proposed fabrics for her approval. Since we weren't in town together yet, I wasn't able to like come over and be like, here's some swatches. Feel yeah, like here's the thing. Them. See them well, that'll be good now when we collaborate, we'd have to do it remotely anyway. Well, you know, I, there's something that I actually like about using digital, digital platforms for these earlier stages of collaboration because it forces you to create more paperwork and more of a trail. Um, and sometimes then you end up remembering what your first idea was more vividly because you had to put it all down on paper. Whereas if you're always together all the time and a lot of it ends up being conversations, sometimes things fall through the cracks. Do you want to move forward here? Yeah, we can move forward. Um, so we had to start fittings early before staging rehearsals began. Um, and so the director wasn't in town. So this is some of uh, the fitting photos that we took to send along to her uh, for approval. So for the girls, we had purchased a dress and they were gonna dye it and add additional sleeves and collars for the look. So this was me sending her an image here first of Carolina's dress with our proposed sleeve shapes and we actually ended up saying you know what that sleeve needs to be more exaggerated no the v is pretty but it's a little too sexy we want this to feel more doll like in the demure mm -hmm. um, and then on the right hand side you see the con we had this coat and we we're like do we like the fur coat that collar that came with it that we didn't realize came with it or do we want to stay with this uh this silk scarf and ultimately we decided together that the scarf was uh better because when he entered, she had him doing this bit of he was throwing his hat at a servant and then throwing the scarf and then throwing the coat, you know, as you, I'm coming into your house and I own the world. So it was better to have more options of yeah. objects to throw at these little kind of androgynous servants that we created for the supers. <laughs> you can go forward. I usually take mostly all, all photos of all the fittings. Um, whether I'm working in person or not, mm -hmm. just so that uh, the director can see what's happening in fittings. It prevents problems later. Yeah. Um, 
So this is just another, this is an example of further collaboration. So this uh, was between the director and the assistant scenic designer and myself kind of taking the character sketches and then putting them and deciding which areas on the set were going to have an accent from their costume because the set was mostly white but she wanted these pops of color you know deciding okay Paulino always goes out into the world and so he's green and which is works really well with the idea that there was all this astroturf around the edge of the set this is his world he's the in between intermediary he doesn't really live in the space mm -hmm. whereas these people live in the space and they had their own bedrooms yeah very cool so you're never working in a vacuum basically yeah there's always always that collaboration and contact yeah we can go forward. Yeah. And then these are just uh, some of the production shots from uh, the final from the final dress. Like you got um, exaggerated. Yep. So sleeve. we ended up making those sleeves a lot bigger. Um, ultimately, I hadn't actually drawn it with the petticoat showing, but in fitting, we saw that that looked really cool. We showed it to the director. She was like, yeah, let's do that. That looks even more doll-like that we can see these petticoats sticking out. Yeah. Um, and you can see here for the actor's comfort in the original, in the original, uh, oh no, come back. All right. Uh, in the original sketch, I had no socks on Paulino, mm -hmm. but we mm -hmm. chose to put them on because we wanted to get some more textures. And we yeah. like the idea of using polka dots just like Ron Carolino's dress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it kind of unites them as yeah. like a, a subtle character detail, but something that they know and they can kind of feel that right. connection. And especially in this show, each of the characters only had two looks. Mm -hmm. And Carolina and Paulino only had one look each because they don't actually end up going to bed. Mm -hmm. But everyone else gets woken up and they're in their pajamas. Um, so when someone's on stage for a whole opera or a whole piece wearing the same garment over and over again, if you don't take the time to sit and find those small details, the audience's eye is going to be kind of tired. So you want to give them some treats to notice along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to see how you, you carried the color through you know, just little details, you know, the sleeping cap, the, the mask. Right. Um, I don't know if we can see it here, but what, what's she holding here? Oh yeah, well, so, <laughs> so I actually took swatches of everything that was built or showed the garments to props because any prop that was assigned to that character needed to match the costume color as well. So I, you know, took swatches over to paint so they could get colors that matched what we actually did for the doorway and talked with props and showed them what I was doing so that they could spray paint this little teddy bear to be orange for Elisetta. Um, yeah. I, I, was it, do you know who came up with the name? I think they named it Tangerine. I, I didn't know Sierra that. Or Delaney or Noah. And, you know, some, some it was Noah. Yeah. And, but it was hilarious, like, you know, just kind of came to life. and It was cute because in that whole aria, she then she was talking to it. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, oh. It was just a, a little sidebar question. Um, there are times when props come from props. There are times when props come from costumes. Like for people who are watching now or I'm later. Sure. Is there, are there any kind of rules that determine how that happens? Or is it just... Uh there are rules there are rules um so if 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 it is something that the actor only carries it's props problem but if it's part of the look of the costume or is actually worn that's costumes problem so sometimes stage managers might put into props oh we need a pocket watch no the pocket watch is a personal item that is really dealt with by costumes Mm -hmm. parasols are usually dealt with by costumes and canes because those tend to also um, connect to that personal look that's being developed by the costume designer for the character yeah. um, but it's always an argument usually let's, let's say if you're doing you're doing a production where you know there, there are garments on stage or fabrics on stage does that become a conversation usually between costume design scenic prop like all together like oh let's let's unite these worlds let's have these textures these colors yes totally well you need you all need to be talking together you know a really good props uh designer or artisan is always talking to everybody else mm -hmm. in the process not just the director um whenever we stop talking together as a group is when we start to have problems um but yeah like so if you have a bunch of clothes on stage they're going to come from me ultimately mm -hmm. 
but perhaps needs to come and talk to me and say, hey, I need these things. And if I worked with you a long time, I might be like, well, here's my vision and you can go and kind of pull things that you want. But more, nine times out of 10, I did a new musical last summer and it was this guy coming of age in the 70s. And at the end of the show, he runs away from home. Mm -hmm. And so we needed vintage clothes to go into that suitcase. And so what we did was we just took everything I had pulled for him that we ended up not using for the show. And those were just his clothes that happened to be in his closet. Okay. And I just said, okay, props, we're done with our fittings. Here's all the things that we didn't like for the songs. Take this, you can use it for the set dressing that way. Nice. Yeah. And I've worked as a props person too. So like, that's a actually pretty common overlap. People who are interested in costumes and props tend to overlap quite a bit because there's mm -hmm. some similarities there in terms of how closely it is that you're really reflecting one specific character's vision yeah. of the world. Forward here, quick forward, yeah. some more shots. Just here. some more shots, just showing how bright the colors were. You Here's know, it was just a very, very fun show where we just got to really lean into using bright, saturated colors against this beautiful, blindingly white set. Um, and then Steve was the lighting designer for this. And so he really got to play with all these colors on the psych and do these fun things behind the white set that made it pop out even more. I yeah. feel like Noah said poppy a lot. This needs to be very mm -hmm. poppy. It was. <laughs> it was. And so it was. <laughs> it was very bright. Very yes, bright. it was very bright and very fun. Um, okay, very, very different show. So on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> um, this is the one that we just did and yeah. we're not talking about scenic design this week, but you served as costume design and scenic design. That's true. Production. So how, did that change the way you were able to design the costumes or did you kind of, kind uh, of, we talked with Matt a little bit about like the term sonographer and like that more right. European tradition. So what does it enable you to do on both ends? Well, it gives you more control, but it also then you are responsible for so much more and you have to talk to so many more people at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, right because now you have to talk to the TD and the scene shop and you have to talk to the costume shop and sometimes they want to talk to you at the same time um, I, I don't know that it really necessarily changes my design perspective mm -hmm. it just gives you more work it gives me more work and it gives me it's kind of a double-edged sword because it gives you an opportunity to really have control over a large portion of the visual storytelling but now you've reduced the people that you can talk to about the visual story by one person, right? Yeah. So now you don't have that scene designer who thinks mostly always about scene design to be like, hey, I'm gonna do this. What are you doing? Da, 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 and have those conversations. Um, so while I've done this more than on, on several shows where I'm the scene designer and costume designer, I don't know that it's always my ideal working situation at the end of the day. I, Not in a bad way, but do you ever get into arguments with yourself? I get into my arguments with myself on a regular basis. So like, that's the thing. <laughs> no. Right. no, but I, I think, I think yeah, for on this show, for me, what happened was because we had to do the uh, scenery so early, by the time we came back to costumes, I felt very removed from the scenery. And I wished that when we had been talking about scenery, I had been folding in the costume stuff at the same time because mm -hmm that would have felt really good, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't think it negatively impacted the show. I just think be it's nice. better if you time it out for yourself so that you're kind of doing it a little more concurrently than I did on this particular project. So for this one, I don't have a lot of research plates because what Scott and I ended up doing is meeting, these were just some initial research plates that I had included when we started talking about scenery. Um, we ended up meeting later and I had just developed a really big Pinterest board that we went through and said, oh, like this, I like that. So if we go forward, I dumped some images off the Pinterest board into here. Um, so the top left image is a, a dress that's at the V&A. And it is a directly what uh, the draper who did the garment for Genevieve, we directly used the research from that and kind of just replicated this dress, but with different fabrication. Mm -hmm. um, in the center, you see some images that we looked at because we liked the idea that 
every that there was something wrong in this place and that maybe it was that everything felt a little moldy or a little bit distressed and so these center images were very interesting and scott and i talked and scott was really interested in doing something that had this kind of western feel americana feel um so these are just some images of that. And then I included the guy on the right because there is so much water in the play or in the opera. Um, and there was something really evocative about the colors in this piece of art and the reflectivity in the water and the blood on his hands. Mm -hmm. There's something about that was the color palette. Sometimes when I'm doing research, it's not always things that are directly a costume or historical mm -hmm. research, but more something about a feeling. And that's yeah. one of those ones. And this, this pop, little pop of red really stuck yeah. with me. And in, in thinking about there's a character of a child in, in this uh, Yignol, and I thought, okay, well, it's not scripted, but we, I want him to do something, you know? And it was played by a, a college age female actress, you know, in a pants role. And so to help it feel more, more childlike, you know, we, we gave her this red ball. So I, I pulled that from just seeing that and thinking, oh yeah, let's have something that's red that we see. And it sort of, you know, became representative of that. Or this became representative of that moment. Yeah. Let me just have a little more images. These are more connected to Melisande. Mm -hmm. uh, this first one really inspired her initial hairstyle. Yeah. And then the other two kind of influenced the flow of her initial garment. This idea of this lost girl in the woods who doesn't seem to belong to the world that she's in. Yeah. That inspired a lot of the choices there. Um, and after that, then I did my initial sketches. A lot of times this is really more what my initial sketches look like. They're just in pencil with notes on the side. I shared these with Scott. So mm -hmm. um, you can see the supers were meant to uh, reflect Melisande. So the supers had both a kind of a blue dress with lace that reflected her first look and then a gray kind of cotton dress that reflected her second look of the things that uh, she wore once she was married to Oh my God. Hello. Hello. All I could think was our Kel. Feel, that was wrong. Like another lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> that was so long ago. It was like 5,000 years ago at right. this point. I know it was two months, but it was 5,000 years. It feels like longer. Yeah. But you can see, I'm thinking on there, oh, you know, maybe his colors feel like bread beginning to mold. Maybe there's this kind of texture that feels crumbly with cabling and, you know, the vest has gotten worn out, you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. Over here. Um, Here's that same that same silhouette. Yeah, same kind of thing for yeah. uh, Jean Biev and Galot and Arkel. Um, just trying to keep into this kind of mid 1870s to 1880s kind of silhouette mm -hmm. and western. Um, and then this is an example of collaborating with a draper. So I was fortunate enough to collaborate with a draper whom we sometimes hire. Uh, to BW. Her name is Diana. She's amazing. She does amazing yeah, things. Right. She makes your drawing look better than you thought on a person. Huh. Um, and so she and I collaborate a lot during text via text because she works out of her house. Um, and so she'll be sending me these pictures of here's the drape <laughs> in like 1030 at night. And I'm like, oh my God, it's 1030 at night. This is amazing. <laughs> so these are just some of the images that she actually sent to me before our first fitting uh, say, hey, is this what you were thinking? If not, I can change some things before the first fitting. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's my final rendering on the side there. Um, and then this was the first fabric fitting with the actress. And we were taking pictures to show to Scott. Um, just, you could see a lot of all the little thread marks indicating where things are folded or where the waistline of the garment is and those eventually get taken out. Um, and then this last image here is once we had, we had done our final fabric fitting, Diana sent me a picture with placement of these buttons so that I could approve where the buttons fell on the garment. A lot of detail. What are the, are the markings in chalk or like a fabric? Pen? What, what are they? Uh, no, it's, it's just a single thread basted through. Okay. Yeah, we do that a lot to mark things that we're only going to mark temporarily, but mm -hmm. they need to be very visible in a fitting. So a lot of times you'll just baste with a contrasting uh, color thread and then you just pull it out really easy. Yeah. Forward here. 
Um, and then, you know, you're not the only person doing this. If it's all in your head, you're screwed. So there's a lot of paperwork that I'm responsible for as a costume designer. <laughs> so on the right hand side of the screen, uh, it's kind of the beginning of my shopping list that I send to my shop manager um, with the image of the thing I need her to buy, who, what character it's for, and then a link. We do a lot of online shopping um, because it reduces our running around stuff. So we'll order things online. Um, and then on the left-hand side is an example of a dressing list. And this is a, a, a document that I make and I share both with the actors and with wardrobe. Uh, so that everybody knows what you're supposed to wear when you're supposed to wear it. Um, I usually post them on the mirrors for the actors so that they know, hey, in scene two is when I'm gonna change into my other costume. And in scene six, I'm gonna wear this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that will be taken by wardrobe to create a check-in sheet because they're responsible for making sure that the actors look the same every night and that their clothes are clean and pressed and appropriate. And so they make a, a check-in sheet. So they check it in, when they come in at the beginning of call and then after the actors are done, they make sure everything is still there. So nothing's maybe stranded out on stage or mm -hmm. what have you. Now you mentioned, mentioned wardrobe. How do they, later we'll be talking with music staff. So we'll talk about like orchestra management and that whole silo. We'll talk with stage management sure. and that silo. How does, how does wardrobe exist in its silo and how does wardrobe and stage management interface you know, in, in the backstage world? Sure. So sometimes a wardrobe can be perceived as very self-sufficient. Um, and in some ways, wardrobe is pretty self-sufficient because they don't necessarily uh, like collaborate with the deck crew or the, the light board op or anything like that. Um, but wardrobe really will stay in contact with the stage manager. I actually give dressing lists also to the stage manager and also a copy of all my writing drawings to the stage manager because the stage manager is also responsible for reporting if things were worn incorrectly when they come out on stage. That's also part of, they're also part of that continuity piece. So wardrobe and stage management work together during the run of the show about things that happen because the stage manager can see things on stage that wardrobe can't. So when someone comes off stage looking crazy, the wardrobe person can be like, hey, do you know what happened? And stage manager can be like, dude, I don't know. They just lost their mind and, you know, trip or something. <laughs> um, stage management is also responsible for scheduling all of my fittings during the fitting and production process mm -hmm. um, and making sure that the actors know when and where they're supposed to show up. Yeah. So if someone doesn't show up, we first call them because we usually have, we have their phone numbers, but then we also call stage management. Um, and if, if, if you have like, say you have uh, actors who are in actors equity, if they don't come to their fittings, they will be fined. So if you're working in a professional situation, there are consequences and repercussions. Yes. Um, yeah. So we work, I work, I, I know I have tons of relationships with all the stage managers I've ever worked with because I'm always talking with them via rehearsal reports or in the room during production meetings. And um, as you mentioned, like conversation is key. You know, conversation. Like, yes. If you're collaborating, not talking, you're conversating, you're figuring it out. It's like, yeah. it's, I feel like if you can get along in the production atmosphere, you can get along anywhere. Exactly. Well, you know, the worst thing to do I, something I learned from my husband, the worst thing to do is when someone gives you a note to like react negatively. And the best thing to do is go, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. And absolutely. that's his MO. And I'm like, that's really good. So I stole it. I, I have heard him say that verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Aaron, do you think we could, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> see what we can do. And, and that means, you know, I'm always looking to get to yes. Yeah. And yes, doesn't always mean exactly your vision or exactly my vision. Usually yes is somewhere in between in the gray area. Yeah. Nice. All right, I'll, I'll move forward here. All right, so here we have, what do we have going on here? Oh, I just didn't have any, I, this is the only, those are all of the drawings from the show. I did it in watercolor because it was a watery show, but also something about a show that's period feels more appropriate to do a watercolor rendering. So these are watercolor. Nice. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. I don't know. I explained it better in my watercolor demonstration for class the other day. No, no. It, it, it so I made it so it looked like it was moldy around the edges because for me, it's really satisfying that that rendering really represents the whole feeling of the show. That it's not just the schematic that I'm doing for the shop, that I, I share it with the director. I share it with the actors. There is something emotional in the creation 
of the rendering that then needs to be translated in the reality of how fabric and clothing actually work on an actor's body. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, it's, it's cool to be able to see it all here in one, one visual shot. So you can see how, they, how the world lives together, yeah. where she was, how they're trying to make her fit into their world. Exactly. How these, you know, the, the servant characters that we created, how they're, you know, related to her and related to this world. And you kind of see them here in action as their yeah. vat women. The vat women. <laughs> the vat women. These regenerative women that yes. Jean Viev is just recreating over and over again for Golo so he can try to find some measure of happiness in this confusing world. <laughs> That's a cool shot. Very cool shot. Here I'll jump forward. Oh, and there's just some more production shots here mm -hmm. so you can kind of see it in the context. Yeah, no, it's great Great to see them together. Now you had initially, you had planned to like give this some entropy and some decay, but it, I think it just ended up being too beautiful and we didn't want to mess with it too much. I think it? that there was something really interesting then when we saw her that she was kind of almost pristine because she, over time, I feel from our initial conversations, and what happened through staging, she became kind of almost a sorceress. Mm -hmm. And so if she was in charge of life continuing to regenerate in these weird vat situations, <laughs> then why would she seem decayed? She would have the power to, to appear exactly as she desired, right? right. right. Um, so I think that's kind of how it ended up there. It was just like, oh, it doesn't need that. It doesn't need it. Yeah. Also, this was in a very close space. And so you could discern the watering on that garment a lot more easily than you would have been able to in a larger house. And so I think that created some of that texture for us that I thought was really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned some of those, you know, the things you were talking about were discoveries that we just went along the way and found. And that's been a bit of a theme, you know, we just talked about when, yeah. when collaborating and creating theater with others. I mean, sometimes you make a choice because you have to, because you have to solve a problem. Sometimes mm -hmm. you make a choice because you, you see something and you kind of collectively look at each other and say, oh, let's do that. That's better. You know, and yeah. so there's a lot of a lot of fun with that. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's like jazz. Yeah. But what if this, da, da, da. I wouldn't say improv because I'm terrible at improv, but I'm good at music. So I'll say jazz. No, but yeah, but this that idea of, you know, seeing something and, and being able to pivot and, and find it and discover it. Yeah. Well, it's really important not to be married to your ideas. You have to see the flexibility in them. You have to. Yeah. be able to respond in the moment yeah. so she, here's Melisande surrounded by her vet women collecting flowers and they all were in these kind of creepy white blonde wigs and they had white contacts so they were very eerie individuals oh, they, they did such a good job just they, they were moving all the towers and could barely see and it was, it was they looked creepy and wonderful and beautiful at the same time yeah but I think that's it yeah, that's all there is. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to say was that you know, I also always want to come into a fitting, even though we've discussed things, that there's a little flexibility in those drawings. That if the actor has been really thinking about a character, I always say to the actor or the singer, you know, you have just spent more time in the last week and a half with this character than I maybe have individually with your character. What have you discovered in the room? Because I want to know what the actor or singer is discovering in the room about that character. If, if I can incorporate some small detail that honors that intention that was set in the room that I just wasn't present for, that's important to me too. Yeah. Very nice. Well, Christopher, do you have any questions? You, have, you always have great questions. So I'm wondering <laughs> if you have any. Um, what do we consider to be like the top traits and skills that make a successful costume designer? Oh. Well, flexibility, <laughs> a good knowledge of clothing and how it is constructed, a, a working knowledge, because if you are, if, you, if you're working, you should be working with people who really know the ins and outs and building. But like when I went to graduate school, I chose my program specifically because there was also the construction element offered. Mm -hmm. um, an ability to work with a lot of different kinds of people is really important. Oh, I don't know. This is like an interview question. I feel that there's more, but to me, for me, being flexible and open is really important. And, and to find investment in the show, no matter what, you have to find that investment in it. Often as designers, we don't get to choose our pieces. 
often directors get to choose their pieces more frequently as to like what they really, oh my God, this is my show, right? But designers, we tend to take more work that not necessarily we're like, yeah, let's do another cabaret or whatever, right? So you have to find your in into that into that world and into that piece sometimes it's like a secondary or like the maid who walks on but you get into it there and then you find your rhythm in it um mm -hmm. so i think it's just about having a good sense of people yeah at the end of the day Definitely. any other questions christopher mm -hmm. um what is the um mm -hmm. When something goes wrong, yeah. What? How do you deal with that as as the costume designer? Um, whether that's something that happens on stage or if it's something that happens in the pre-planning. Oh, okay. Well, so if it's during tech rehearsal, I'm going to call hold. <laughs> First of all, uh, keeping a calm head and trusting the people that you work with. So there's nothing worse than a costume designer who when a quick change goes wrong, runs backstage and tries to run it. Because you need to trust your, your wardrobe people. This is the first time they've done it and they need to look at it and they need to figure it out. And then you can have a conversation and say, hey, by the way, when I was designing it, this is what I was thinking, but not overtaking it. Um, I don't know, I, I feel like when you run into issues, it's about listening. I, I, to me, it's really basic people skills and has some, sometimes really nothing to do with the art itself. It's about listening to what the other person is saying and trying to get into their mindset. I always really enjoyed being an assistant because I liked trying to understand how that designer thought so that when they were starting to get into a stressful situation in a fitting or they needed something, I could go, okay, what have they been thinking throughout this process? How can I run to stock and solve this problem for them? Mm -hmm. That was always really satisfying to me. So I think always just trying to get into the head of your director and trying to understand their overall viewpoint of the world and the play helps a lot when you start running into problems. Because I think most times when you start having issues with a director, it's because either you aren't listening or they aren't listening. And the only part you can control is yourself. So you have to be very open and listen as much as you can. What did you say? I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to the to the idea of like what makes a good costume designer, I personally feel it's important that you know how to sew and that you know how to put things together. But William Ivy Long isn't doing that. He has all of these assistants. Some of his assistants, I think, do his renderings for him and he just comes into fittings and says this, that, the other thing and throws feathers around, right? But like, I think it's important to understand how things go together because you can then more fully control what things look like if you understand how it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and then you are better at picking fabrics because you're not bringing someone stretch fabrics for a garment that would really be better out of something that was really more stiff and woven. Yeah. Awesome. Any other things to parting thoughts, Tesha, words of wisdom? I don't know. I hope we get to still do this when this is all over. I know we will, but I feel very dramatic about it right now. <laughs> Yeah, well, understandably so. Especially for, uh, for in costumes, I'm in a lot of Facebook costume groups and everyone's going, what is that going to mean? Are we all going to be like having to wear masks for like a year and a half after this? We touch everybody all of the time. How do we like even think about that? So right. I think yeah. that's most present with me right now. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how do we rehearse and how do we keep people safe in that process? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, 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 it's going to get interesting, I think, but will. Art endures. I think mm -hmm. things happen all of the time and we will eventually get back to doing what we do. But yes, yeah, so someone had posted you know, something, I forget how many pandemics, but in the 400 some odd years of opera, we've endured 127 different epidemics or pandemics. So sure. we'll, maybe this is a time when that that oldness and that history will, will help serve us and get us through, but we'll, we'll yeah. find a way. We will. We'll find a way. I don't know. I'm just glad I get to do what I do. I make a I make clothes for imaginary people. So there you have it. Well, you, you do a great job at it. They're beautiful, Thank and it, it's a yeah, uh, pleasure to collaborate with you. Oh, well, I love working with you too. Looking forward to the next one. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, it can happen. Once we know what the schedule is. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, Tasha, thank you very much. Thanks for taking time. 
thanks for joining us. Thanks for asking me. Um, yeah, Christopher, thanks for joining us from England, man. You're getting the the attendance award. We're gonna have to like. It's nice the, to meet you. Yeah, yeah. The, the person who attends the most gets some swag. So at this rate, we're gonna have to get you like a first class ticket over here or something to attend oh, a production. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's scenic see. cleveland ohio <laughs> yeah. sunny sunny yeah. cleveland ohio <laughs> i'm originally from northern canada so everything scenic to me good <laughs> <laughs> all right well well thank you both and uh hopefully uh hopefully we get to do this in, in person soon but absolutely all right take care y'all stay safe stay healthy mm -hmm.